I want to thank Imperial College, in particular the Theoretical Physics Group, for inviting me here today to give this talk. It is such a privilege to be a part of this celebration. Abdul Salam is by far the greatest scientist Pakistan has ever produced. It is an absolute honor to have the opportunity to pay tribute to him. And it is such a joy to be able to introduce him to so many of you young people. You will have learned from the exhibition you've just seen that Salam was awarded the Nobel Prize, along with Steven Weinberg and Sheldon Glashow, for electroweak unification. A little later on, I'll try to explain what that means, but for now, I want to point out that this instinct to unify, to transcend boundaries, for Salam, this goes deeper than physics. Salam straddled careers and cultures. He was a practicing physicist at the same time that he was the director of the ICTP. He had the heart of a poet and the mind of a scientist. He seemed to belong equally to both East and West. He was a brilliant scientist, yet a man of faith. All these supposedly conflicting qualities, Salam united in his person. Many have commented on this very rare ability, and while it is undoubtedly a unique gift, I believe a small part can perhaps be ascribed to the culture and traditions at which he grew up. I think you will have a more nuanced appreciation of Salam if you are aware of his roots. So that is where we will start. Salam was born 98 years ago today in Chang, which was then in United India and subsequently became part of Pakistan. Chang is in the province Punjab, which gets its name from the five rivers that run through it. Chang itself is on the banks of the Chenab and not too far from the capital city, Lahore. The Punjab is very fertile, agriculturally and actually in every which way. It is lush, vibrant, full of bright color, excellent food, a lot of warmth, loud songs and dance. There is a zest for life here, which I think Salam carried with him. But alongside this flamboyance, there runs a deep romanticism. A famous folk tale in the region is that of Heer and Rancha, star-crossed lovers who died for each other. But this is not just another Romeo and Juliet story. Heer and Rancha are elevated almost to sainthood. And I think that says something about the values of the culture. There is in Chang an actual shrine to Heer Rancha. It is a holy place where people come to pray because love is considered transcendent here. Devotion is seen as a sacred act. And I think that is a view Salam continued to hold long after he left Chang. In this mystical and vivacious place, dreams and omens are taken very seriously. This is Chaudhary Muhammad Hussain, a local school teacher and Abdul Salam's father. One night, he dreamt of a young boy climbing a very tall tree. He called out to the child to come down, but the boy just smiled and kept on climbing until he reached the clouds. An angel told him that the boy's name was Abdus Salam, he who serves peace. And when Chaudhary Muhammad Hussain's son was born, that is the name he was given. Salam's father took his dream as a prophecy, a promise that his son would ascend to unimaginable heights. And so Salam was brought up with a lot of care. His circumstances were modest, but he was surrounded with love and his education was given serious attention because it was treated as a calling. Salam went to the local high school, which was then, and still is now, a very basic structure, but he was gifted. He was a studious child with incredible focus. And of course, he excelled. Salam's first major triumph was when he secured the highest marks ever awarded by the Punjab University in the matriculation exams, which are somewhat like the O-levels. Salam was just 14 at the time. His picture was in all the papers, and when he biked home with the news, his entire village was standing there to receive him. For college, Salam went to Lahore, 
the capital of the Punjab, the city of gardens. Lahore was quite different to Jhang in that it is very much a large, bustling city. But here too, there's a lot of colour, a lot of life crammed into even the smallest spaces. Lahore has a long and storied past. It was a favourite city of the Mughals who left many beautiful monuments behind. This is the Shalimar Garden, the Lahore Fort, the Wazir Khan Mosque, and the Badshahi Mosque, to name just a few. These architectural gems were exquisitely designed and adorned with gorgeous geometric patterns. Surrounded by all this, how could Salam escape the lure of symmetry? By the time he got to Lahore, the British had also added their voice to the city's story. They had built many institutions, including hospitals, museums, colleges, one of which, Government College, was where Salam studied. Salam excelled academically and was also the editor of the college magazine. He wrote articles on Urdu poetry at the same time as publishing his first research paper. Upon graduation, Salam won a scholarship to Cambridge and at the age of 20, he set off on a three week long journey by ship to England. Other than a short interlude, Salam never lived in Pakistan again. From here on out, he lived mostly in the West, and that is how his, most of his biographers knew him. Because he fit in so well, it is not always obvious how his background shaped him. But if you look carefully, I think you'll find the traces are there. Cambridge is where Salam started his study of physics in earnest. He saw it as a quest to uncover part of the divine design of the cosmos. As his biographer and Imperial College alum, Gordon Fraser, put it, science for him was a form of devotion, his reverence to a higher power. Zalam spoke about how bewildering the universe is, how wonderful, how rich, and how exciting he found it to think that underlying all this splendor, there is an invisible structure. But the sheer diversity of natural phenomena is staggering. How does one even begin to study this? By categorizing. When you try to understand something, it helps if you have a scheme to slot things into. So we label and separate this wildness into some semblance of order. Just as Lego bricks can be sorted by color, physicists sorted nature into two classes matter and forces. The smallest matter particles, those that are considered the building blocks of nature, are the quarks and leptons, and they act upon each other by way of the four fundamental forces. It is human nature that we find explanations more powerful if they apply to many different situations. They seem to pack more of a punch. Physicists have formalized this instinct. As Salam put it, from the earliest times, man's dream has been to comprehend the complexity of nature in terms of as few unifying concepts as possible. One of the most familiar examples is gravitation. It seems obvious now, but when Newton first put it forth, the idea was actually quite daring. At a time when the skies were thought to be the homes of gods and angels, and the earth was the domain of imperfect mortals, it was quite a leap to claim that apples fell on the Earth for the same reason that planets orbited the Sun. Newton brought together heaven and Earth and made them subject to the same law, universal gravitation. Centuries later, in similar vein, Maxwell showed that electricity, the flow of current, and magnetism were deeply intertwined. The previously separate realms of electricity and magnetism were unified into electromagnetism. We experience space and time in such vastly different ways that no one even thought to question if they were in fact distinct. No one until Einstein, that is. In his theory of relativity, Einstein knit space and time together into a single fabric, space-time. Unification is a goal physicists aspire to, 
But for Salam, it held more than just an intellectual appeal. For him, the search for unity among diversity was a religious impulse. In Islam, God is known through 99 names, each revealing a different attribute. But they all belong in the end to the one Allah. When Salam studied physics, he learned about four forces. Gravity, electromagnetism, both of which had been long familiar. And once technology allowed us to peek inside the atom, we found two new forces, nuclear forces, that we had not previously known about. There was the strong force, which keeps the neutrons and protons bound in the nucleus, and the weak force, which causes radioactivity. Here is Salam recounting how he was first introduced to the forces. I still remember very vividly one occasion when our teacher taught us what has become my specialty, the unification of fundamental forces. He told us about the forces in uh, Jhang. And he said uh, gravity is one of the important forces, of course, gravity we had all heard about. He took out a magnet from his pocket and he said, this is magnetism, he showed us the iron filings being attracted and so on. Then he remembered to say electricity. He said electricity, ah, electricity. Electricity does not live in junk. It lives in the hall, the nearest place where the electric current was still available. And junk uh, had electricity five years later. It's just true. And uh, then he went on to discuss the forces of nuclear power and so on. And said, ah, oh, well, they live in the hall. They live in Europe. They don't live in Pakistan here at all. So that was the introduction which I got to the nuclear forces. Salam took it upon himself to unify electromagnetism and the weak force. But apart from the fact that one lives in Pakistan and the other lives in Europe, there are other more consequential differences between the two. The most obvious, perhaps, is that electromagnetism is a push-pull kind of force, um, and the weak force is alchemical in nature. It does not move objects in space as gravity or electromagnetism do. It causes them to transform. Another major difference is that the electromagnetic force is infinitely long-ranged and the weak force can't even stretch across the proton. So as a quick aside, um, we won't go into any detail on this, but I just wanted to mention that by now it was known that forces are able to act across space because they are carried by particles known as bosons. This had been a long-standing problem um, from Newton onwards. People had wondered how gravity and electromagnetism are able to act across large distances. So the idea was that each force has a characteristic boson, uh, force-carrying particle, and the properties of this particle determine the behavior of the force. Electromagnetism has infinite range because it is carried by the massless photon. So the fact that the weak force dies off so fast implies that the associated bosons must be incredibly heavy. These came, uh, came to be called the W and the Z bosons. Electromagnetism was described very successfully by what is known as a gauge theory. So if there was to be any chance of unifying the two, the weak force would also need to be described in terms of a gauge theory. A gauge theory is a theory that has symmetry at its core. Symmetry, it turns out, is a very strong constraint. Once you impose symmetry, that dictates the kind of particles the theory can describe and also the interactions that can exist among them. Now, gauge theories are based on continuous symmetries, like that of a circle, which you can rotate about any angle and still have it look exactly the same. But I wanted to give you a flavor of the argument to show you what a strong constraint uh, symmetry is. So here is a very rough analogy, not to be taken too literally. So say you decide your theory should have six-fold symmetry. This basically means you can rotate something by 60 degrees and have it look the same. Um, this requirement then determines which shapes are possible. So hexagons would be allowed by the symmetry, for instance, but squares would not. But we said that gauge symmetry doesn't only determine the particles uh, or the shapes in our analogy. Uh, they should also, uh, gauge theory should also determine 
how the particles interact. So in this analogy, let's take that to mean the ways in which shapes can connect. And I'm going to say that allowed interactions are those that leave no gaps in between the shapes. This is not a problem for hexagons. They can connect seamlessly. They tile the plane, we say. So hexagons um, are allowed to interact with each other. And a theory of hexagons would be consistent. But we could also have a six-sided star or a snowflake. This exhibits six-fold symmetry as well. So it should be one of the allowed shapes or allowed particles in the theory. But stars cannot dial the plane. No matter how you connect them, there are always empty spaces left in the middle. So these stars do not have one of the allowed interactions or allowed forces between them. And a theory of stars on their own would not be consistent. But what you could do is have a theory of stars and hexagons, because now there's a new dialing pattern that becomes possible. So we know that stars can interact with each other through hexagons. Again, gauge theories are far more complex than this, so don't take the analogy too literally. The point I wanted to make is that gauge theories are based on symmetries, and symmetries impose very strong constraints on the structure of the theory. Symmetry was of deep interest to Salam. There was an almost cultural conditioning and aesthetic appreciation that was inevitable given his background. As he himself said, his interest came from his Islamic heritage and the ideas of beauty, symmetry, and harmony with regularity and without chaos. And so I like to think it was almost as if he was looking out at the world through the Jali, which is this pierced window, in the Shish Mahal, the Hall of Mirrors at the Lahore Fort. Um, in similar fashion, Salam began looking at the equations of the weak force through the lens of symmetry. There were some tantalizing hints in the equations, but in describing the weak force as a gauge theory, there was one glaring problem. The formalism of gauge theories requires that force carriers be massless, like the photon. But weak bosons are very massive, if you remember. How do we get around this problem? Well, it turns out the hint is in questioning the idea of mass. So what follows is just an analogy. Don't take it too literally. But I just wanted to give you a rough flavor of the argument. So if I ask you what mass is, one answer you may already have come across in your physics curriculum is that mass is a measure of inertia. If you push two objects with equal force, the one that moves faster, accelerates at a greater rate, has less resistance to motion. So you would say it is less massive than the one that moves slower. In this example, the same force is applied to three balls, all of which move at the exact same rate. So the natural conclusion would be that they have equal mass. But what if you run this experiment again a little while later and you find this behavior? So it would appear that the red ball has become less massive because it moves much faster. The blue ball has gained mass because it moved much slower and the yellow ball has remained the same. How could that be? This puzzling behavior would make perfect sense if you find that after the first experiment, but before the second, an electric field had been turned on. And the red ball carried a positive charge, so it was pulled along. The blue ball carried a negative charge, so it had some repulsion to counteract. And the yellow ball was electrically neutral, so it remained unchanged. In other words, mass does not have to be intrinsic to a particle. It can be acquired through interactions with the field. Salam and Weinberg's breakthrough was to realize that the bosons of the weak force could start out massless, just like the photon, and gain a mass through interacting with the Higgs field. So then you could ask, why wasn't this field giving mass to particles all along? Well, it turns out it wasn't always there. 
the field arises as a result of a broken symmetry. A broken symmetry is when the rules, so the equations, remain symmetric, but their implementation or the solution to the equations is not. This is a somewhat subtle point. Salah explained it using the following very charming illustration. Say you have a round table set for dinner. There's a glass placed to the right and left of each dinner plate, and there's no obvious way of knowing which one should be used. It comes down to a choice, whether that is social convention or the individual choice made by a thirsty guest who's just tired of waiting and picks a glass. But their decision then determines the course all the other guests must follow. Notice that the choice could have been made either way. Both options are as good as the other. Both make for coherent systems and peaceful dinners. So making a choice amounts to breaking the symmetry of the table setting. Now you could of course choose to preserve the symmetry, but then no one would get to drink anything. Often in nature, interesting things begin with the breaking of symmetry. But that's a whole other conversation. For now, just know that a symmetry is broken and this turns on the Higgs field. Different particles then interact with this field in different ways and as a result, some, like the W and Z bosons, gain mass, while others, like the photon, stay massless. Initially, it was thought that the weak force had only two bosons, both of which carried electric charge. They were known as W plus and W minus. But as work continued on the theory, it became apparent that a third electrically neutral boson would also be needed. This is what came to be known as the Z. Here is Salam explaining how this third boson was related to the first two. The analogy could be with the three domes of this beautiful mosque in Lahore in Pakistan. The two smaller domes do make up a composition which has a certain type of symmetry, but that symmetry is perfected only by the addition of the third, the larger dome. The task of the theory would be, in this case, to determine the relative sizes of the three domes to give us the most perfect symmetrical pattern. We found that we needed a totally new type of weak force. In terms of the analogy with the domes, in addition to the two outer domes, we needed a third new dome representing the weak forces in addition to the electric forces and that this pattern would make a symmetrical whole. And if this new force did not exist, all of our ideas, however elegant, would be totally worthless. But of course they were correct. And so electromagnetism and the weak nuclear force came together as the electroweak force. And that led to the 1979 Nobel Prize in Physics. This was the story of Salam, the physicist. But there is a whole other aspect of Salam, a parallel career almost, the man concerned with politics and organization of science, and with the terrible problems of poverty and backwardness. Salam was truly a global citizen, one of the first such of the world, as he is referred to here. He forged new bonds without compromising the old. He was loyal to Imperial College, the ICTP, and till the end, to Pakistan. This is Salam, the research scientist at home in Imperial College. Uh, on top, there's a picture of him giving his inaugural lecture, then there are pictures of him with his friends and collaborators, P.T. Matthews and John Ward. This is Salam, the international physicist, interacting with the top minds in the field. That's him with Paul Dirac, Robert Oppenheimer. And at the bottom, there's a picture of him with the distinguished Pakistani physicist Riyazuddin. They're standing at the Nathya Gali Summer Conference, an annual school Salam set up in the mountains in Pakistan, so that experts from all over the world could come and lecture to local students. Almost 50 years later, this conference is still going strong. The spheres of science and diplomacy don't often intersect, but Salam gave of himself both to research and to institution building. The picture on the right is him presenting at a physics conference, and on the left, 
he's at one of the first meetings of the Scientific Council of the ICTP. The ICTP was Salam's answer to the intellectual isolation faced by so many scientists in developing countries. He knew this pain only too well, and he did not want others to suffer as he had. As John Zeman wrote, the memory of those anguished years became the kernel of his greatest achievements. It took a lot of effort and persuasion to set up the ICTP and constant commitment to run it. Yet against all odds, this bustling railway junction of the intellect, managed by the brilliant improvisations of a devoted staff and always short of funds, lives and works and grows. Salam felt passionately that the disparity between the developed and the developing world is not due to the will or ability of the people. But much like the masses of the photon and the weak bosons, these differences are just an artifact of the environment. And if you remove the differences, if you bring people to a place where they can meet on an equal footing, you will find that people from all over the world are the same. It was with this in mind that he built the ICTP. Here he is walking in Trieste, holding the keys of the ICTP for the first time, and at the bottom is a re relatively recent photograph of the main building. So we've come full circle now, and I hope that you see what I meant in the beginning when I said transcending boundaries was a repeated motive through Salam's life, that he unified more than just electromagnetism in the weak force. Salam was truly passionate about physics. He worked long and hard, but he worked in the shadow of a prayer. The frame on the wall bears an inscription of a 16th century prayer, which Salam translated as saying, O oh Lord, grant me a miracle. Salam's faith was not an impediment to his science. He believed miracles were possible, but only if you were willing to work for them. You see Salam here on the two major occasions that bookended his life, his first victory and then his greatest. He proudly wore a pagri on both days. Often people leave their past behind if they move on to more glamorous lives. Salam held on to his roots long after he grew wings, and for that I deeply admire him. There's often a boundary between genuine humility and monumental success, but Salam managed to transcend this divide as well. On the one hand, he sits with the Queen of Sweden at the Nobel banquet after being awarded the prize. And on the other, he sits at the bedside of his old, frail, ailing school teacher, whom he painstakingly tracked down. He placed his Nobel medal in his teacher's hands and said, this is your medal, sir. When we hear stories of amazing accomplishments, it can sometimes feel as if everything's already been done. But nothing could be further from the truth. As Salam said, the whys of one generation are but the point of departure for the next. So if any of you young people here today is inspired to consider physics, please know that there is much left for you to do. There are many opportunities for you to make your mark. For starters, there's the standard model of particle physics in which Salam's electroweak theory plays a very large role. It is one of our most successful frameworks to date, but it is neither complete nor final. There are certain assumptions upon which the model is based, and if any of those are shaken up, the model becomes unstable. There are many parameters, we call them, quantities that need to be measured and put into the equations. The theory does not predict these numbers itself, so it's not as self-sufficient as we would like it to be. And of course, there's the fact that the standard model leaves many phenomena unexplained, like gravity, for one, but also dark matter. I'm sure you've heard this already, but the standard model with all its spectacular successes only appears to describe 5% of the universe. So take all the matter we know, there's five times more out there that we can't see. Then there is the question of unification, which is still unanswered. Can the strong force be combined with the electroweak force? We don't know. Could gravity be added to the mix? so that we have just one master force? And going one step further, is it possible that we could perhaps unify the two categories of matter and force into a single entity? Salam thought about all these questions and they still remain open today. 
said, I'm engaged with physics deeply and multidimensionally. For him, science was far more than a vocation. It was a way of being. It satisfied him on a spiritual, intellectual, practical and social level. He found in science an understanding of the world and the divine design. He found in it practical and tangible benefits. And he also saw it as a vehicle of cooperation for all mankind. But if you're watching this and science is not your thing, it doesn't matter. Someone once asked Salam about how to ensure that young people were trained in the fields that the country needed at the time. And he answered, I'm paraphrasing here, that what is important is to establish a culture of excellence. If someone is passionate about what they're doing, it makes no sense to redirect them and require them to go train in something else. He said, if a student's heart is in one thing, what will you do? Stop them giving of their best? So his point was that you should pursue whatever it is that lights a fire under you and do it to the best of your ability. Harness your passion, focus on quality. And once you establish a tradition of excellence, you will find that the culture around you itself changes. As you've seen, Salam concerned himself with very large problems in physics and society, problems in which it takes a long time to see results. An interviewer once asked him how change happens, and Salam answered, the most important step is breaking the mental barrier. This is a short talk, and we focus mainly on Salam's successes, so it may seem to you like he led a charmed life. But he faced more than his fair share of challenges as well. There were many problems along the way, many setbacks, but he worked through them. Someone commented on his ability to always take a positive approach to ideas and Salam replied, people are very good at showing where ideas are wrong, but they do not often offer anything in its place. I prefer to build. And on that note, and because Urdu poetry was so dear to Salam, I thought we should end with a poem that is both a message of hope and a call to action. This poem by the Pakistani poet Muhammad Iqbal begins sitaro se aage jahan aur bhi hai abhi ishq ke imtihan aur bhi hai beyond the stars lie many worlds still to be seen there are many tests of devotion still to undergo kanat nagar mein hum to say don't rest on your laurels there are untold wonders ahead but also, don't bemoan what is lost, because there is still so much more to come. And then there's the reminder, you were born to fly. Many skies stretch in front of you. And it ends on this note. Gone are the days when I stood here alone. I have many allies now in this crowd. I really hope that is true today, that Salam's message resonates with you and that sitting here in the audience are some of the young allies who will carry his message forward. We inhabit a time of increasing polarization, unfortunately. Boundaries are being drawn each passing day. Boundaries of race, religion, ethnicity, politics and creeds. There is more of a need than ever before, it seems, to reach across the divides and remind ourselves and each other of the common humanity that unites us. I can't think of a better gift we could give to Abdus Salam.